Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh. Decir buenos días. Right. Buenos días. I'm muted. Thank you. See, I don't need this. Thank you. Now we are. <laughs> um, before I read uh, Psalm 44, I want to thank you as a congregation for praying for us, for supporting us in this venture with Equipping Leaders International. Um, some of you asked about this trip. I just got back uh, this past week uh, from Bolivia. Just God just doing amazing things. Be encouraged. The, the Bride of Christ in different parts of the world uh, is beautiful. People are growing. This pastor with whom we partner, uh, the congregation there, they, they are just zealous for God, for His Word being proclaimed. Uh, so your prayers are desperately needed uh, for this congregation, other congregations, but God is doing a good work. Good work. And so it's my privilege to come alongside of them along with other ELI uh, faculty and just to encourage them by teaching them. And they take what we teach and then they go and teach it to others. And there, there's a group of about 50 to 70 leaders, potential pastors there in La Paz, Bolivia, and they are just eager. Some of the hardest questions I've had theologically have come from them. So I felt like I was being grilled for an ordination exam. <laughs> but thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, uh, that wasn't the case. But anyway, so thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, we are indeed indebted to you by the grace of God. Let's give attention to God's word, Psalm 44. Psalm 44, I'll read the entirety of uh, this psalm. To the choir master, my skill of the sons of Korah. O God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm and the light of your face for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God, ordained salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. Selah. But you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe and those who hate us have gotten spoil. You have made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us a taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me, and shame has covered my face. At the sound of the taunter and reviler, at the sight of the enemy and the avenger, all this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you, and we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals, and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake! Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up, come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Let us pray. For the sake of your steadfast love, O oh God, for the sake of your glorious name, we pray that you, by your Spirit, would illumine our understanding, that you would cause living water to come from that rock, even Jesus. And that we would be fed, Lord, heavenly bread, even Jesus, 
this morning. Lord, unless you minister to us and open our ears and our hearts, we won't hear and we won't receive what you have for us. So we pray that you would give us spiritual comprehension, but above all, a heart to trust you, to love you, to glory in your matchless name. But we pray this in the name of our Redeemer and Lord Jesus. Amen. Some of you probably know the name Brian Kelso. He's a PCA pastor, uh, pastoring a church in Florida, has been for many years. And also for many years, he's been involved in a ministry in Haiti, uh, where he's been ministering to the people of Haiti. You know, it's an island nation that's been ravaged by hurricanes and earthquakes and all kinds of poverty and misery. I was reading about an occasion in, in which he made a trip in August of 2010 and ministering there. He came back from Haiti, went back to minister in his church in Florida. And in the evening service, after he had finished preaching, he felt really bad, and just physically bad. And he felt that he probably had a pretty high fever. And so he rushed himself near to a nearby emergency room. And when he got there to the emergency room, the medical staff took him quickly after the, he went through triage, and they placed him in an ICU, intensive care unit. And the doctors labored to save his life. Why? Because he had a terrible case of malaria. His vital organs had shut down. He was placed on life support, and though by the grace of God he survived, he had portions of both of his feet amputated. He was gone from the pulpit for many months, but when he came back to the pulpit, he spoke honestly to his congregation and he said, look, I don't understand. I don't understand what God is doing. I've been to Haiti for hun hundreds of times. I know nobody that's contracted malaria. So why? Why has this happened to me? And he goes on to tell them, in his letters, look, I was, when I was talking with him, I was in a very dark place. I really couldn't tell you where I was spiritually. I felt alone. But I'll tell you this, I did not feel the presence of God with me. And you know, you hear that from a pastor, right? And you go, man, that, that is astounding. That's hard to take. And I think when I read that, it reminded me that what he was expressing and what others have expressed is what the psalmist expresses in Psalm 44. The sense of feeling defeated, of the, as if God is not there, feeling abandoned of God by God, living in the midst of darkness, and experiencing affliction and hardship, and simply not understanding why. Why? God, it just doesn't seem to make much sense. And you and I, if we haven't already in life, we've experienced times like that. What I call these perplexing providences of God. Things that God sovereignly brings into our lives and we try to make sense of them and we just can't. Right? We struggle. We struggle to make sense of them. You see, and I think this psalm helps us because Sometimes we, we don't quite know what to do. How do we express all that we're feeling with the words that God has given to us? And I think this, this psalm, is, you know, God is, through this psalm has provided the words for, these, for expressing what we feel in those struggles, in the affliction, in the difficulties, in the tragedies oftentimes, in the sense of, being, of feeling forsaken by God. Right? And, and, it's, and here's what I want you to understand clearly in this psalm. It's not because the psalmist lacks faith. It's not because he lacks faith, brothers and sisters. It's because he's a man of faith. And yet, what does he do? What we see in this psalm is a psalmist laments. And this is what faith looks like when it laments before these perplexing things inexplicable providences of God in our lives. When we simply can't make sense. What is the sovereign God doing? Help me to understand it. We don't get much clarity. At least not in the moment. 
So what I want to do is divide this psalm up into three parts. And in verses uh, 1 through 8, in the midst of this affliction, this, and this uh, mysterious providence, frowning providence, what, what does the psalmist do? He recalls God's past victories, God's redemptive works. So, so it's really a call for us, for you and me to, you know, in the midst of those perplexing providences, remember, okay, I need to remember how God has worked in the past. That's what we're going to look at in verses 1 through 8. But then in verses 9 through 22, in the midst of those perplexing providences, he laments. And so there's a call for us to lament the present disgraces that we're experiences, experiencing. And then verses 23 to 26, how he calls us to implore. What do we do with this? We implore our covenant faithful God. So that's where we want to go this morning. So first of all, in the midst of difficulty, trials, afflictions, suffering, feeling that God is not around, is not near, you're in a dark place, where does the psalmist take us? He says, this is what you need to do. You need to remember God's past victories, verses 1 through 8. And so, where do we see that? You look in your Bibles. What does it say in verses 1 and 2? Oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. What he's alluding to and recalling is God driving out the Canaanites from the land of promise, and God planting and establishing his people Israel in the promised land of Canaan. And you know, behind that, there's this, all this story of the glorious display of the power and the works of God. So you know that behind that, there's a story of God displaying His sovereign, glorious power in, in delivering Israel from their enslavement in Egypt. How God brought you know, these plagues down so that His people might be set free. How God took them out of Egypt, brought them to the Red Sea, parted the Red Sea so that they could go through on dry land. How in the wilderness, God fed them with manna and quail, and he directed them for many years, taking them later on, that second generation, across the Jordan River, so that they could see the walls of Jericho come crumbling down, and then enter into the promised land. So he, what's he doing? He's recalling, oh God, you have done this. There is no doubt about your power. There's no doubt whatsoever. He's recalling the past redemptive deeds and victories of God. But jump with me to verse 7. Because there, there we see that it's not just the distant past that he recalls. But verse 7 brings us a little closer. More of a, a, a past, but it's a little closer. It says, but you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. As if he's thinking about a battle with the enemy, and he's, he's remembering, yes, God, you have done that. You have saved us in this recent past. And so you see in verses 4, all right, you know, uh, 4 um, and through 7, for you are my king, O God, ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you, through you we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. It's as if you say, look, Lord God, you've done this in the past. And I know, I know that you are sovereign king in the past. But you are my sovereign king now. You're still ruling and reigning now. It's not something just in the past, but also in the present. And all is under your control. And I know that under your authority, we win the battle because you fight for us. Do, do you see that? And then in, in verse 3, he, he comes to, as he recalls the past, the past victories of God, he says, For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them. But your right hand and your arm, the light of your face. And verse 6, For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. See, as he recalls the past, he's not thinking about, Hey, look at all the good things we did. 
look at how much faith we have. No, don't look at my might, don't look at our strength, don't look at our, at our sword. But what is he recalling? Not that Israel had a great army or great power, but rather they had a great God who had accomplished these things for his people. That's what he's recalling. He's recalling the greatness of God's acts of redemption and powerful victories for his people that obviously don't deserve it. So these are acts of grace of God. Now, notice something really important. Verse 1. O oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us. These past victories of God, the distant past that come to mind, those victories of God were told him and the congregation by a former generation, by their parents, by grandparents, great-grandparents. You see, the way God normally works, right, ordinarily, you know, so that children come to faith in Christ is the parents and grandparents, a former generation, speaking of the works of God to their children. And so we cannot live in the present as if the past does not matter. So parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, keep on speaking to your children of the works of God in history, in the scriptures, but also in your life. And young people, listen to your parents as they tell you of the works of God. And if they don't speak to you of the works of God, would you pull on their sleeve and say, tell me how God has been at work in your life. I want to know. I want to know. Because I want to believe in this same God. You know the hymn, Tell Me the Old, Old Story of Unseen Things Above, of Jesus and His glory, of Jesus and His love. That's, that's what we're saying. Tell me that old, old story. But not a story from which I'm disconnected, but a story that becomes my story as well. And, see, and you see the psalmist say, that that story, that redemptive story, is my story too. Do you see that? Let me give you an illustration. Years ago, I read about a middle school teacher teaching history uh, and talking specifically in that week about the independence of the United States from Great Britain. And then pulled out this facsimile, you know, photocopy of the Declaration of Independence. And you've seen the, you know, photocopies of the Declaration of Independence. There's a text. and the bottom of the text, there's all these signatures, right, of all the signers of the Declaration. So the, the teacher passes this document around, this facsimile, and the, you know, the students look at it. They look at it for a few moments, and then they pass it on to another student. Well, it got to the hands of this one student. Now, you need to know this one student was, his parents had just immigrated to the United States. He'd been here for about a year. So he's, he's looking at this document, you know, as, as a recent immigrant. And he reads over it, and he looks at all the signatures, and then he cautiously, solemnly takes out his pen, and he writes his name underneath the name of those others. And you go, oh, how cute. It's, it's actually very insightful. It's almost like saying, Yes, that occurred almost 200 years ago. And you could say that's disconnected story. Uh, all those things that happened, but somehow it doesn't affect me. He says, but no, I am now part of that story. That story becomes my story. That history of how God has worked has now become my history of my God. Do you see that? You see... The point in all this is the psalmist and the congregation. They have genuine faith in this God, this, their king. They know, they have no doubt about his ability and his power to save and to act on their behalf. And so we come to verse 8. In God we have boasted continually. And so they boast, another expression of genuine faith in God, because they boast in the glory in God, not just one time, but continually. This is something that forms part, as part of their lives. But no sooner had they finished boasting in the Lord, verse 8, than we come to verse 9. And how does it begin? In some of your translations, it might have yet, 
but other translations has but. But. But you have rejected us and disgraced us. In the past, God, you've given us victory. In the past, you've displayed your marvelous power, triumphing over our enemies. But now you've rejected and disgraced us? I simply don't understand. Why can't you do in the present as you have done in the past? Don't you ever want to ask God that question? It's almost as if you're saying, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're doing here now. Do you see, there's, there's, there's a seemingly, you know, the seeming disconnect between what he has heard about God, what he believes of God, what he's seen God do in the past, and now his present experience of misery and defeat and affliction. So where does this take him? It takes us to our second point, verses 9 through 22, where he laments. You see, he laments. Now, I want you to understand something, brothers and sisters. When we read the Psalms, and we read these laments, and we read these complaints, it's never, they never, the psalmist never crosses the line into sin. Never accusing God of sin. But men, are they honest? And sometimes their honesty makes us uncomfortable. And this is where he takes us in these verses. Notice verses 9 through 11, as we look secondly at this call to lament our present disgraces. It says, But you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our enemies. You have made us turn back from the foe, and those who hate us have gotten spoil. You have made us like sheep for the slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. Lord, we have suffered a military defeat, and we thought in the past you've always gone out with us, but you haven't gone out with us. The enemy has triumphed. They've gotten spoils from us. We've been slaughtered like sheep. Verse 12. What does he say? You have sold your people for a tribal, demanding no high price for them. Lord, it just doesn't make sense to me. It simply doesn't make sense. Well, I just don't understand how you get any benefit from this defeat. We certainly don't benefit. Do you benefit, Lord? Because you have sold us for a few bucks. You didn't even ask for a high price for a trifle. You just gave us away to the enemy. But I thought, oh God, I thought we were your special people, your treasured possession, the apple of your eye. And yet, it seems like we're treated as if we're worthless, of no value to you. Verses 13 and 16, he goes on. You have made us like the taunt, the taunt of our neighbors and derision and scorn of those around us. You've made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me, and shame has covered my face. You see, he says, we're your people. I'm yours. And yet, I'm the object of ridicule and scorn. They're laughing. Listen to them laugh. As if you are not with us anymore. We feel humiliated, disgraced, and covered with shame. And it's a shame that everybody can see. I can't hide it. That's what he says in verse 15. I just can't hide it. Do you see what he's experiencing and why he's lamenting? On the one hand, he knows that God is the redeemer, the provider, the powerful rock and king. But then their experience seems to present to him this contradiction. And isn't it true that we have our creed, what we believe, and then sometimes our experience, they seem to collide. And they clash. But it gets worse. It gets worse. Verse 11, I want you to notice there, the second part of verse 11 says, and you have scattered us among the nations. So he's saying, look, you, we've lost, we've been defeated, We've been scattered off, carried off as prisoners of war, exiled among the nations. So he's, he's just bringing this complaint before God. 
Now, what you need to know is this, this is what God said he would do if his people were unfaithful to the covenant. Deuteronomy, the last few chapters of Deuteronomy, what we have there is this God approaching his people and basically telling them this, if you are faithful in this covenant, in this relationship with me, which I promise to be you, God, and you, my people, if you are faithful, I will bless you. If you are unfaithful, I will curse you. I will bring down curses. This is what he's saying. And one of the curses that God promised in Deuteronomy 28, I'll, I'll read one verse, Deuteronomy 28, verse 25, it says this, The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. This was the covenant curse that God had promised, if they were unfaithful. But this, my dear friends, is precisely where we find the rub and the problem. What is he saying? Verses 17 and 18. With that in mind, with Deuteronomy in the backdrop, all this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten, and we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. You hear what he's saying? You hear that? He says, Lord God, we, we have not broken covenant with you. There is no blatant sin against you that we've committed. We've not committed idolatry. We have not forgotten you. Now, keep in mind, he's not saying that they're blameless or that, that they're perfect, they're without sin. What he is saying is that they've practiced true religion, that they were faithful in this relationship with God. And he supports this claim by noting in verses 20 and 21 that if their suffering were a punishment for their idolatry, he says that God would have told them so. Verse 20 and 21. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? Wouldn't it have made it plain? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Do you see how he's arguing scripture with God? You see, he does so because there's no apparent reason, no reason that comes to his mind that he understands for this reversal in war, for this suffering, for this defeat. The expected covenant blessing, not what seems to be a covenant curse. So what do you do when you live in that kind of reality? Here is God doing something, but you know he's faithful and true and wise and good, but it seems like he's acting in a way that, you know, seems to contradict his faithfulness. Well, we know he's not. You know, how do you make sense of our trials and of our, of these, of this, the suffering and, and these perplexing providences? Let me just say a few things that serve perhaps as boundaries to clarify. We may not get the answers that we like, that we want, but there are some things that we do know. And what is it we do know that helps us to live in this perplexing providence that produces so much tension? And one of, the, one of the truths that we need to keep in mind is that suffering that we endure is not necessarily because we have disobeyed God. Okay, keep that clear. And the reason I say this is because oftentimes when I suffer, I experience some grievous affliction, I tend to think, first off, I must have sinned. Right? I don't know if anybody else is like this. You know, you look at your life, there must be some sin in my life for this to happen. But, I remind you, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, the disciples ask Jesus when they see this man who was born blind, right? Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither, neither, but that the works of God might be displayed in him, so that God simply might be glorified. Is that enough for us? Suffering sometimes is used by God to discipline us, sanctify us, 
But I can tell you this from Scripture, that it is not for the child of God. It is not punishment for your sins. It is not a punishment for your sins. How do we know this? It's because all our sins, past, present, and future, have fallen on the Lord Jesus Christ as He hung on Calvary's cross. And there He was crushed for our transgressions. There He satisfied divine justice fully. It was fully accomplished. Our sins are completely paid for. There is nothing left for us to pay. And so in those moments when you want to think, oh, what did I do wrong? Why? Why this suffering? And you want to think it's because of my disobedience. No, and God has punished me. No, no, no. You remember the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he said, it is finished. The debt has been paid. And so, brothers and sisters, remember that. Remember that truth and you hold on to it. Lots of things might be perplexing, but that is not perplexing. That stares us in the face, that glorious historical truth of Christ taking our sins upon himself and forever satisfying the justice of God. There's a second truth. And we need to keep in mind that suffering isn't the result of God not being in control. Right? God is always sovereignly in control of all things. Every moment of every year, every week, every day of our lives. And the psalmist has an understanding of the sovereignty of God that includes, includes the painful circumstances. You know, I'm glad we read that section from the Westminster Confession of Faith about the providence. Because there, you know, it, it makes it very clear. God is not the author of sin. But yet in other sections of, of our confession and theology, we, we read and study about God being the primary cause. Right? So it's not just bare permission. And we read that. Now, I, but then there's secondary causes. We are the secondary causes, if you will, right? Now, so as we think about this military defeat, did God shoot the arrow against his own people? No. Did God take the chains and put the chains on his own people and then drag them to the end of the nation? No. It was the enemies that did that. And yet, and yet, God is in it. God is in it. God is sovereignly in control over these afflictions. Look, look at those verses, 9, beginning. Verses 9, you can go through 9 through 16. Don't miss that word. What's the psalmist say? But you have rejected and disgraced us. Verse 10, you have made us turn back from the foe. Verse 11, and you have made us like sheep for the slaughter. 12, you have sold your people for tribal. 13. You have made us the taunt of the neighbors. 14. You have made us a byword among the nations. You, God, you, God. How do you live in that tension? Do, do you see? This is this psalm is this song is chock full of a theology of the sovereignty of God. It's not just bare permission. He recognizes that. Sometimes we don't like living in that tension between a sovereign God and, ex and experiences that we can't explain. We'd like to resolve it. You know how people have tried to resolve this in the past? Some have tried to deny the, that God is all-powerful, the omnipotence of God. So many of you know, you know Rabbi Kushner, right? Some of you remember from way back when. He wrote that book, uh, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Why did he write that book? Because he had a son who was diagnosed with an incurable genetic disease and died at the age of 14. And he was wrestling with, how, with God's role in suffering. And he came to this conclusion that God is not to blame for his son's death. How did he get there? He said this, God is not to blame because he's not able to control all the factors in our lives. He doesn't have all authority and power, therefore he can't control all things. 
That's one way of relieving us of the tension. Creating a God that is impotent and is no God at all. What kind of God is this if he has limited power? Others have tried to remove the tension by denying his omniscience, that he lacks all knowledge. And this was fostered years ago by open theists. In open theism, one version of that says that God does not know the future. Why not? Because the future is caused by our free will choices. And since our free will has not yet caused the future, God cannot know what the future is. Therefore, he cannot be responsible for what is happening. And they come up with this idea thinking that somehow this God who doesn't know the future, he's able to come alongside in a, with more compassion. Come alongside people who are suffering. But brothers and sisters, you know well that the testimony of Scripture is contrary to this. God knows all things because He has ordained whatsoever comes to pass. And this is precisely what makes it so hard for us. When we're in these perplexing providences, afflictions, going through really difficult times, and it doesn't seem to be an obvious explanation, we want to say, well, God, and we know that you know all things, and you are sovereign, you have all power, so why don't you change it? If you've never gotten there, maybe you need to be more honest. There's a third truth we see in verse 22. Sometimes suffering is simply for God's sake. Verse 22, yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. It's simply because we are the people of God and the world and unbelievers hate us. And sometimes we are counted as sheep for the slaughter simply because of that. You've read, no doubt, and heard about uh, Dr. Helen Rosevere, a missionary, a doctor, English medical missionary to the Congo back in the 1950s and 60s. You know, and, uh, and she did some amazing things there with other missionaries, established a training school for nurses, a hospital, a center for leprosy, treating those with leprosy. And, and in 1964, after all these buildings and the services and ministries were going on, civil war broke out, and all the medical facilities they established were destroyed. Helen, along with other missionaries, were uh, uh, arrested, uh, placed in prison. And one moment, uh, she tried to escape. She was captured once again. And after they captured her, she wrote this. They found me, dragged me to my feet, struck me over my head and shoulders, flung me on the ground, kicked me, dragged me lifted me up only to strike me again. A pain of broken teeth, a mouth full of bloody, a bloody mouth, my glasses gone beyond sense, numb with horror and unknown fear. Why? Simply because you belong to Jesus. Just because we're his. Makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? Do you remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8? We all love Romans 8, right? We all love Romans 8. Here's the Apostle Paul, you know, talking to these, you know, the, the saints who are wrestling with their sin, and he's saying, look, yes, you're wrestling with sin. You don't want to give in to the works of the flesh, but you have the spirit of the living God inside of you, right? And you, you have the spirit of adoption. You are sons and daughters of God. And, you know, in the midst of all that, in all these glorious truths, that he declares, he comes to verse 35 in Romans 8, and he, and he says, What shall separate you from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, dangerous sword? And you know how he answers his rhetorical question? He quotes Psalm 44, verse 22. And I remember reading that for the first time. I said, Paul, it doesn't make any sense. And verse 22. For your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And it wasn't much later as, as I thought about that. Ah, oh, I see what he's saying. He says, he said, on one hand, he says, look, you will never be separated from the love of Christ. His love is real, unbreakable, irreversible. But I understand this. The suffering that you are undergoing is also real. The love is real and the suffering is real. And he puts in this strange combination the inseparable love of God in Christ and our, our severe suffering. As if to say, understand this, when you suffer, 
when you're in affliction, when you're in a perplexing providence and enduring so much agony, and you just don't know if you get through it, you understand this. It doesn't mean you are not loved by God, but you are profoundly loved by the same God who's offered to you His life, His Son, Jesus Christ. I'd rather not live with that tension of love and suffering. Give me love without the suffering, please. So where does he go with all this? Well, we see in verses 23 to 26, it leads him to implore a covenant faithful God. Verse 23, awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself, do not reject us for forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? Awake, why are you sleeping, O Lord? Some of you, Read that and you go, oh man, he must not be Presbyterian. <laughs> Who would dare say that to God? All right? I mean, that is a gutsy, bold, insistent prayer, especially in light of, of the fact that it's coming from the nation who had a prophet, Elijah, who once said to the prophets of Baal, perhaps your God is sleeping. Speak a little louder. Maybe he'll wake up. So is the psalmist being irreverent? No. He's not being irreverent, my dear friends. Why not? Let me put it to you this way. Where else could he go? Where else could he go? To whom could he pray, if not to the only God that is? Keep in mind, I don't believe that all of a sudden the psalmist forgot his theology. I don't think, you know, if you would ask him, you know, who is God? What is God? God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body. God does not get hungry. He does not get tired. He does not. Say, I don't think the psalmist forgot that. But what he is doing, he's expressing his faith. One, it hurts deep inside. And there are no real answers, obvious answers. And he presents this to God. He knows that God does not sleep. But from his experience, it's as if God is not responding. So it must be like he's just like, do you see that, my brothers and sisters? Do you remember when Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish in John chapter 6? And it had all this multitude following him. And then at one moment, he says some things that are really hard, like you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then people started to leave, right? And he turns to the disciples and says, are you going to leave me too? Remember the response? To whom else can we go? You alone have the words of life. There is nobody else to pray to. So brothers and sisters, when you are in a perplexing providence, don't turn away from God, but turn to Him. Yes, look to the past. Look to those past victories and redemptive works of God, and then lament honestly, present, pouring out your soul before God. But then look, look to the character of God. And this is where he ends. Verse 26, rise up, come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. You see where he's turning? He's turning to the steadfast love of God. And you You've heard this word before, I'm sure, that Hebrew word chesed, right? And he says, look, I may not understand all that's going on around me. I don't understand your, your doing and, your, and how you're executing your decree here, oh God. But I understand this, that you have shown chesed. You have chesed promises to your people. Now chesed, you know, it gets translated here, steadfast love. Other places it gets translated as mercy, compassion. Think of it. Broad. Think of it as the loyal, steadfast, merciful, compassionate, unfailing, pledged, and committed love of God for His people. A love that simply will not let His people go. As Ralph Davis, the pastor and commentator says, it's love that has crazy glue all over it. And He grabs you with it. I won't let you go. 
You, you see? He says, look, this other stuff, I don't understand. I don't understand how all this is working out in life, Lord. But I understand that you are the Lord. The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's where he goes. He goes to the unchangeable characters, character of God. My circumstances change. My circumstances I don't understand. But this I know that you do not change. You cannot unchesed yourself because you cannot lie. Is that enough for you and for me? Kim and I, every December, when she has a break from school, we do a puzzle, a thousand piece puzzle. Sometimes we get really adventuresome and we do a 2,000 piece puzzle. But you know how it works, right? If you've done puzzles, you usually find those straight edge pieces, you create the frame, right? On the outside, and then you kind of group the puzzle pieces together and you combine the colors, the design, and you know, and, and you do that, and you spend a week. We spend a week. It usually takes us a week to put a, piece, a puzzle together. And then, um, you know, and, and it's, it produces such a great satisfaction when you know you you finally come to the last piece, and you can see the image, right? You ah, oh, how satisfying because you see how all the pieces fit together. However, has it ever happened to you? You come to the very end. You know where I'm going, right? And the last piece you can't find. You cannot find the last piece. And when that happens, I say, Kim, you're hiding it. Where is it? <laughs> the dog is taken. Something's happened, right? And, and you get so frustrated. Why is it? Why is it that you have 999 pieces all together, but one piece frustrates you? What if? What if God were to say to you and to me, I have that one piece of what seems so perplexing in your life, and I'm going to keep it, and I want you to trust me. You don't need to see it all put together, but I know how it all goes together. Would we be satisfied simply to trust in God? Or do we have to see it all put together? Can we not trust him who sees it all together? My dear friends, the psalmists, the scripture, invite us to look back. And we can look back to all the works of God and redemption throughout the Old Testament. But primarily, where do we look back? We look back to that great, victorious, redemptive work of God in Jesus Christ at the cross. You want to know God's chesed for you, his, his super glue love for you, and a love in which he says, I will never let you go no matter what you think. You can't make sense of this, but I am not letting you go. And you get a sense of, of how that has come to pass in your life when Jesus took upon himself your sin, when through his shed blood your sins have been forgiven. You've been reconciled to God. You've been adopted into his family. You've been justified. But not only you know, are we to look back to his death at the cross, his crucifixion, but also his resurrection. Because when we look back to that historical victorious work, what do you see? That he has triumphed over your sin and over death over every obstacle. And this same Lord Jesus, he was raised from the dead and ascended on high. And we look back to him and see him at the right hand of God and everything is under his feet. Everything is under his feet. That's where we look, brothers and sisters. When things don't make sense in our lives, we look back there and look up to him who intercedes for us. So in those moments when you think, well, I'm a good person, I don't know why I'm suffering so much. Well, you just think about Jesus. He was the perfect person. And yet he suffered horribly. He could have said to the Father, I've never sinned. Why? Wow, I don't deserve this. And yet he was the sheep led to the slaughter. Verse 24 of Psalm 22. The psalmist says, why do you hide your face? I can't help but think of Jesus on the cross. His father's face was hidden, so it seemed for a time as he was submerged in darkness and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? So that we would never be forsaken by God. What if, my dear friends, what if God would so design suffering so that we might 
as Paul says in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. What if, what if the suffering and the perplexing providence of God simply designed to deepen our fellowship with Jesus. Helen Roosevelt, things got worse for her. She wrote, beaten and bruised, terrified and tormented, alone. I felt at last, I felt at last God had failed me. Surely he could, he could have stepped in earlier. Surely things need not have gone that far. And then when she wrote that, she said she, she sensed the Lord in her mind saying to her, you know, Helen, 20 years ago, you asked me for the privilege of being a missionary. Don't you want it? These are not your sufferings. They're mine. And she wrote, God met with me. It was an unbelievable experience. He was so utterly there. His comfort was so complete. And suddenly I knew, I really knew that his love was sufficient. He did love me. But he didn't take away the pain and the cruelty or the humiliation. It was all there. But it was altogether different. Because now I understood it was with him for him and in him. And he was actually offering me the privilege of sharing some little way in the edge of the fellowship of his suffering. Is that enough for us? For the sake of knowing Christ and knowing him and his suffering and his resurrection, knowing that one day when we see him face to face, it'll all be undone. It'll all make sense. And which one of us on that day when we see the Lord, we'll say, Lord, can you show me that piece of the puzzle? Let's pray. Our Lord and our God. How desperately we need a bigger vision and understanding of you. How desperately we need to trust you in deeper ways. You know our faith is weak, and so we pray that you would strengthen our faith. We're people who want to be in control. We want to act like God and know all things. Well, we know that's our foolishness. But help us to find our rest in the one who knows all things, who is all-powerful, and working out his good and wise and perfect decree for his glory and for our good. Lord, cause us as your people not just to trust you, but to find our rest in you. Find our delight in you and understand once again that you simply refuse to let us go. Nothing else may be clear in our lives, but may that be clear that you will not ever let us go. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of Jesus.